Um, as was mentioned, my name is Neil Adamson and I am the CIO of the Vitality Group located here in South Africa. And I think what I want to do for the time allotted that we have now is just to talk to you about the role of APIs that we use both in our Vitality program and in the larger health and wellness sector. Um, and I do hope that you will find it relatively interesting. So the one thing that did strike me when I was preparing for this talk is really how mainstream APIs have become. And as a result, how much we take API technologies and the companies like WSO2 almost for granted now. I think a few years back, uh, you know, people were talking about APIs, people were exposing them. I know Jeff Bezos did announce you know, back in 2002 or thereabouts that, you know, all of his, all of Amazon's services should be exposed by APIs, but maybe it took us a little bit longer to catch up. But I think we have caught up and really uh, APIs and the API technologies that service those or that provide that feature or the functionality has really become um, you know, part and parcel of the technology landscape. And certainly in Vitality, where we use WSO2 API Manager, Identity Manager, and the ESB to a certain or to a lesser extent, you know, these technologies have become a standard component of our tech stack. Um, and like databases, they really are just critical enablers, especially in our microservices-based architecture. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll go through, as I go through my talk here, uh, you may be also surprised to find how APIs have really have become entrenched both in the system and business world. So just to be clear on this, I don't think that this devalues them in any way. And I don't think that this, you know, reduces the, um, the way in which we should use them. I think rather it cements their place in the tech landscape. And I think once again, you know, referring back to databases or to IDEs or, or, or development languages, it really does, you know, create make these technologies indispensable. And certainly, you know, as a pattern for development, certainly this is the way that I think you'll find a lot of companies are going. Um, yeah, so before I do launch into my full talk, a little bit about our Vitality program. Uh, we are the largest, let me just share the screen, sorry. You know, we, we are one of the, the largest shared value wellness programs in the world. And we do partner with a number of um, companies across the world. So we run what we call a behavior change program entrenched in wellness uh, from a V1 platform point of view, which is our latest vitality technology stack and um, the way that we, we make the, the product available to countries across the world. Uh, we live in more than 12 countries and we operate as a, as a cloud-based solution predominantly on, on AWS. So I think the key here for us is that as, as a platform, we're able to provide behavioral change capabilities across multiple industries. And this is something that we're looking at further as we progress into, you know, expanding into further expansion. How do we bring behavior change and how do we bring these capabilities across to other industries rather than just based in wellness or insurance? Uh, but certainly that is where a lot of our, of our expertise lies. And we, we um, leverage off the experiences and learnings that we have gotten from the South African market. So you'll see in the top right, there's a map where we, we currently operate. We operate in both Canada and the US. Our US membership base isn't that high. We started in Vitality, or on Vitality One with the gym as a wellness program and then COVID hit. So unfortunately that's come to a, a bit of a standstill. We do operate in the US on our, on our, pre, on our existing or our previously built stack, both for John Hancock um, in the US as well. But then South America and then across, you can see UK, Europe, and then across into Asia where we run quite substantial programs for Sumitomo Life and AIA in Korea. Um, and then if you have a look at these sort of areas that we look, we, we're operating in, uh, we have a number of, of partners, et cetera, both in the life insurance and the health insurance market. But we are starting to look at how do we change behavior in the drive market, in the banking market, et cetera, as well as adjacencies or and in the corporate market. So, so from a vitality point of view, we're quite well represented both across a number of vertical industries and across the world. I think if you do look at the program, it's, it's not hugely complex. Um, it is a consumer facing program, so therefore you do want to keep it, you know, engaging, you want to keep it simple and you want to keep your, your members going back to the program. 
And essentially, if you do look at how we work through it, we look at assessments, questionnaires, let's baseline your behavior, let's understand how you operate in terms of your wellness, how much do you exercise, how much do you drink, how much do you smoke, what's your blood pressure, et cetera. Based on those, we set your goals that are applicable to yourself. And then we track those goals and we'll talk a little bit about the, um, the, the, the mechanism which we use to track those uh, going forward. And then key for us is we, we reward you for that behavior. And I think that really does keep people coming back into the program and you know, engaging with us. And I think that's what makes it as successful as it has been across the world. Um, just to give you an idea, we, we very strong on behavioral change theory and practice, and, and we've baked in a lot of research that has come out over the years around behavior change. So you've got these concepts of uh, you know, overconfidence. People always think that they're healthier than they really are. People think that they drive better than the majority of other people. Um, so we, you know, we, we, we base our assessments on trying to understand how confident are you in terms of your engagement with us. Uh, habitual loops, how do you create habits and how do you keep those habits going? Uh, the concepts of instant gratification, you know, if you want your reward now and you'll, you'll achieve your goal, that does keep you coming back. Um, other concepts around behavior change revolve around hyperbolic discounting. People would rather get their $5 now than wait for the end of the month to get their $10, et cetera. Um, loss aversion, if you'd rather not pay for something um, than, than get something for free. So, so I think these, these concepts we really have programmed into the platform and they, they are the concepts that make the program that successful. Okay. So then just moving into more APR oriented discussion, you know, healthy APRs, how, how do these things work? And you know, what, what, what is the trends happening within the health and wellness industry? So we're gonna to touch on a couple of topics here. Uh, we're gonna talk through the growing number of health and wellness and fitness apps, and you can see the explosion around that. Uh, innovation that's taking place in health and fitness, the increased use of wearables. Wearables are becoming um, ubiquitous now. Apple Watch certainly does lead the way, but there's a number of other players, as you guys are, I'm sure, fully aware around Fitbits and Amazon, et cetera. Um, and then we'll talk a little, about, little bit about you know, interoperability requirements for APIs and, and the, the challenges that we have, you know, both in the, in, the, in the health and wellness industry and in the security and regulatory requirements that we, we come up against all the time. And I think those, you know, both from an interoperability uh, perspective and security and regulatory requirements, you can't underestimate how those do impact on, on APIs or on programs that you do make available, uh, either at a global level to a business to consumer market or even to a business to business market. So, so that's really what we do want to touch on. And um, let's go through what we, um, what we have around healthy APIs. So I think what's happening across the world is that there's a, a strong move to a healthier lifestyle. And I think, you know, we're seeing this as increasing exponentially. Um, certainly the increase in disposable income across the world, you know, the number of countries that really have um, you know, stepped, stepped out of the sort of lower demographic areas into, into higher disposable income it is certainly remarkable over the last few years. The, the changing lifestyle, people are becoming a lot more aware of health through changing lifestyles. And then you've got this proliferation of smartphones and devices. You know, there's just so many devices. You see it when you travel now, people, everybody staring at their phone, pressing buttons, etc. cetera. Um, certainly, you know, here, here in South Africa, you can see the growth in smartphones and across various demographics, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, and then you've got this rising awareness and of the benefits of healthcare. You know, people are becoming more obese and they're starting to realize that they don't want to live that way. And, and certainly I think COVID-19 and the reason why we're all sitting at, at our Zoom desk rather than sitting in a, um, in, in a sort of collaborative forum or in, in an in a auditorium, is purely because of COVID-19, but I think this has made us a lot more aware of the benefits of health and, and um, leading healthier lifestyles. Discovery itself in South Africa, I haven't got it in the presentation, but what, what Discovery has discovered is that people who are way more, or who are healthier and who eat better and are in much better physical shape um, suffer way less 
um, from COVID-19 than those people who, who aren't healthy, et cetera. Obviously, comorbidity is a key driver to, you know, to, to the impact of COVID-19. But certainly just having your regular dose of vitamin D, getting your regular exercise has contributed substantially towards your ability um, to resist or to have to create a resistance to COVID-19. Um, so, so I think what you're finding across the health and wellness industry is just this large awareness of it, the benefits of it, and how people are <clears throat> adopting towards it or adopting their, their lifestyle practices towards uh, healthier lifestyles. If you have a look at some of the innovation in health and fitness, I, I picked out some five and, and certainly I did use Vitality at the end, but there's a number of, of them. And I mean, just if you search for innovation in health and fitness on the internet, as, as I did when creating this presentation, um, it's remarkable how much you can learn and what is being done. Uh, but certainly artificial intelligence is on everybody's, um, you know, everybody's agenda. I'm sometimes a little bit skeptical about that. I think people use rules and rule sets as a, as a sort of substitute for artificial intelligence. My view of artificial intelligence is that, you know, you need to train your, your, your system through thousands and thousands of pictures or previous events. And those true AI um, systems are driving a huge amount of innovation. So, so what I've got here is you've got the ability of AI detection systems to detect early stage conditions like cancer, um, diabetes, et cetera and to translate that patient information into diagnostic information can happen 30 times faster than humans. Um, and the University of Heidelberg is getting a 95% accurate accuracy rate in diagnosing skin cancer in the early stages. So, so certainly artificial intelligence in the health and wellness space is going to be a, a major player and is going to have a major impact on, on where we go uh, with you know, cancer, diabetes, chronic diseases, early detections, et cetera. I think another one that's very interesting is this on-demand healthcare. Uh, once again, here in South Africa, Discovery partnered with Vodacom to, to do some um, consultations around COVID, but one of the key ones is the good doctor. I mean, the good doctor in Ping An in China has over 300 million users, which is a, an incredible amount of people if you think about it with over 650,000 daily consultations. Now, if you're getting 650,000 daily consultations, that can drive your AI program, you know, in a, in a way that really just accelerates your, your ability to offer on-demand healthcare coupled with, you know, faster diagnosis, et cetera. But, but certainly on-demand healthcare is becoming ubiquitous. People can talk to doctors, people can create um, online reservations, they can do reviews of doctors, et cetera. And that is driving much better or much wider access to, to healthcare across the, across the globe. Um, data sharing, and that once again speaks purely to APIs, you know, how, how do you share data? How do you, how do you get data from other, um, other data providers, et cetera? Um, but once again, if you take these correlations and if you have a look at what the University of Auckland and New Zealand's done, is they looking at bank data they can provide insights into flu outbreaks. You know, if your credit card spend basically says in this area of, um, of Auckland, you've got a number of people buying anti-flu medicines or flu medication from, from, um, through their credit card from pharmacies, you can start to understand there's an insight, there's potentially a flu outbreak in that environment. And I think this is going to be one of the key points of this whole discussion is leveraging other people's data for correlations and for understanding how you can enrich that data or how you can use that data for your own good or for your, your, own, um, your own product. Um, 5G also game changing in terms of the, the real time data streams that you can get through, through 5G. Uh, I think the, the uplift in data transmission is just phenomenal. And I really do think that that's going to assist in the health, in the health space uh, going forward in terms of digital interactions, data analysis, and real or near real time and more impactful feedback. Uh, I was lucky enough to, to, to go to one of our partners in Korea, SK Telecom, and you know they've got the, the 5G or they've got their technology museum slash university there, and they, they started to talk through the benefits of this, this you know, huge increase in streaming of data um, and how it can help both in self-driving motor vehicles, in medicine, um, and just generally your day-to-day -day world around you know, access to much faster real-time data. 
And then I think vitality, I think we're doing quite a lot and you know, we're quite proud of what we do in driving health and fitness across the globe. Uh, we've got our data exchange where we can integrate with anyone, anything, anywhere. And the concept of federated development, which really is through our WSO2 developer portal, it opens up the vitality ecosystem for our partners, dev teams to work with us and to create um, additional features and capabilities on the platform. So um, once again, we think that that's really driving a lot of innovation in terms of our program across you know, our various partners and helping them implement what they need to implement inside the program that potentially we haven't even thought of yet. Um, and once again, you're going to get the COVID-19, which is really proving to be a technology accelerator um, and, you know, get this proliferation of tracking apps and new apps that talk through, you know, what, what can we do to, to manage, treat, prevent, contain COVID-19 across the world. And one of the interesting things that, you know, came up during the, the research for this talk is McKinsey really said that this COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the evolution of healthcare ecosystems. And to me, that was, was quite interesting because from a, a vitality point of view, you know, we call it the vitality ecosystem or the vitality platform. And that really is a contribution of people's ideas and, you know, innovation or new features into, into the ecosystem. Um, I'm not going to read the full McKinsey definition of an ecosystem, but certainly if you have a look at, at what they are saying there, one of the striking features for me was if you do have an ecosystem, APIs enable these ecosystems. You want to collect data from third parties, you want to make your data available to third parties. I mean, an ecosystem really does define an open system rather than a closed system where you know, you're generating data, you're holding on to it, you're keeping it, and you're not sharing it with people. Um, from an ecosystem point of view, it's an integrated value chain. Customers, suppliers, platform service providers need to make the data available, they need to make the features available, um, and you need this backbone created by seamless data capture movement and exchange to create more of an open and improved efficient um, ecosystem. So, so to me, the point here is if you, if you look at the way platforms are going, large companies are going, they want ecosystems, they want open environments. And the way that you do that is ensuring that you have APIs that are exposed to third parties or you, you, you leverage off people's APIs from, from other third parties to enrich your ecosystem. And once again, that just shows how mainstream APIs have become across the various platforms that we, we engage with on a day-to-day -day, um, um, basis. Wearables. Wearables are fascinating for us. We've been involved in, with wearables around about four or five years now. We started with this idea um, with Vitality a long time ago that if you went to gym, you would, um, you would get your discounts, you'd get your rewards, you'd get your free movie tickets. Um, the key question there was, how do we know you're going to gym? And at that stage, we'd integrate with our large gym providers in South Africa, and they would send us a list of people who went to gym. Um, essentially, you could swipe your card and walk out and you'd still get your vitality points. What we're doing now with wearables is, is you know, we're collecting data from workouts, we're collecting data from steps, et cetera. So in about four or five years ago, we really started integrating the data we get from wearables into vitality. Um, and, you know, we've watched the growth of this. Also, to a certain degree, the consolidation of wearables, but certainly, um, you know, you've got your large ones, you've got your Apple Watch, as I said, Samsung, Garmin, Fitbit, Sunto, Polar, etc. So, so um, whilst you, you, we, we thought there would be this huge explosion of different manufacturers, um, that has been slightly contained around the sort of more trusted brands. But certainly there's been an explosion in the number of users who use wearables and who use them on a daily basis now. And I think they are becoming far more um, ubiquitous and acceptable in, in, in societies across the world. Um, so, so yes, ID Tech estimates this to be a $50 billion, billion plus industry. Um, and certainly from our point of view, we think that this has laid the foundation for the consumer internet of things. You know, what other IoT devices are going to be made available. And, and once again, just having a look around, you've got contact lenses with a built-in display currently in development. I think that really does build on what Google Glass was doing. 
Um, you've got this aura ring. And I think this is a key one for us because sleeping, people don't like to sleep with watches on, certainly from personal experience and, you know, talking to, to various people. If you sleep with a watch, it can be comfortable. But if you've got a ring um, that can do your general health and wellness tracking, people don't know problem sleeping with a, track, uh, with a ring on. Um, that one has particularly been piloted by the National Basketball Association for COVID-19 trackers, of, you know, tracking of players as well. Um, you've got a Wealth Smart Belt, which looks at fall detection. Apparently, it can also tell you if you've overeaten um, <clears throat> or if you, have, if you haven't eaten enough, etc. And then Amazon, you can see, is getting into the game as well with their new Halo device. Um, and, you know, Amazon worked with us to integrate that device into our US John Hancock Vitality program. So we've had some experience with them. Uh, but certainly now around the wearables market, you're getting fitness trackers, smartwatches, ECG monitors, blood pressure monitors, biosensors across the world. And we, we do see this as being something that's going to grow and really become a lot more ubiquitous as, as time goes on. Um, and certainly from a vitality point of view, you know, we, we want to integrate with these devices so that we can collect information to understand your health and wellness status and then to reward you accordingly. I think the key for us, though, is once again, you know, WSO2 has caused us a huge, you know, given us huge uplift in this because APIs are critical in the, in the wearable IoT environment. They enable the transfer of data from the wearable device to the online cloud-based accounts. They enable the transfer of data from these accounts to third-party apps. And, you know, our Vitality device platform, which we're doing, you know, 25 million or so records a day, uh, reads data from multiple wearers, um, wearable manufacturers for use in the Vitality program. And those are all through the APRs that are exposed to the mem or to the um, to, to us so that we can use them to collect that data, et cetera. So, so certainly from a wearable point of view, APIs and the ability to safely, securely collect that data has become a critical um, capability that we really do leverage off across the world. And you can see we collect data, and this is just a few of them, Samsung, Apple, Garmin, um, into any number of our vitality instances across the world. Moving on now to some of the challenges, I think interoperability for us is very interesting. You know, um, you know talking to the, the devs who work with us on a day-to-day -day basis, we still don't have standards when we collect data from Garmin or when we collect data from Fitbit, et cetera. Um, they've got their own proprietary interfaces, they've got their own uh, exposed through APRs, but their own proprietary data structures, data fields, and data descriptions, as do our other departments uh, or other partners. Uh, you've got good best practices for API development, um, and I think those are maturing, and I think that you know we all understand them. But data standardization is still a challenge, and I think that does inhibit data sharing. If, um, the FIRE or Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resource, you can read up a lot about it, but the adoption does seem low. So even at the sort of critical health record sharing level, still seems to be a challenge for people to share the data. As I said, wearables, the market is still fragmented with little or no standards. Um, and, and we've had that experience firsthand. There's really no clear standard for devices integrating into our device platform that we can say, all right, well, you know, um, if, it's, if it's using this standard, we can collect the data much more quickly or much easier than we currently do. But once we've got it into our environment, if we just go back to the previous slide, we can pass it down to any one of our fatality instances because we standardize the data at our VDP, but that's going into the fatality systems and not going out with it. Um, and so I think that, you know, there's still a lot of complexity uh, for various reasons around interoperability. I think, once again, if you have a look at this, at these challenges, more and more platforms and organizations are offering third-party access by APIs. Um, and, and even if you move away from the health industry, you can find APIs for Teams, Office 365, NetBank, a, a local bank here in South Africa is an API marketplace, um, Slack, LinkedIn, Garmin, Google, Fitbit, Facebook, etc. Um, APIs are ubiquitous, as I said before, so, so you can use them. The, the challenge there is, is understanding, you know, what, what are the interfaces that are defined from every party's APR and potentially creating a specific integration into them rather than being able to standardize on it. 
So the key here is what do we do? Um, you know, from, from our point of view, we would love standardization. So it's a little bit of advice that, that I think we can give is don't contribute to the chaos. If there are standards and if there are data structures and, and you know, if there are patterns and models that you can use that are industry specific, rather adopt those, um, rather take those and expand on them or, or leverage off them to increase the adoption of them rather than reinventing the world or building your own. Um, so make industry standards your base standards and then be consistent in your terminology. Document your APRs. I think often we find when we talk to people and their APRs are not documented, it becomes just so much more challenging. Um, ensure version control and keep your developer portal up to date and current. I think from our point of view, it's starting to be a critical capability to have all of our APIs well-defined, well-documented and well-structured so people can use them. Uh, so, so I think just a key point for us um, or for, for you know, the, the, the sort of advice I can give is try and make sure you adopt your standards, um, your, your industry standards rather than, than build your own. Then security. Security across the world is is just growing in leaps and bounds. You know, we have hacks, you've heard of the Garmin hack, and you'll see at the bottom of this presentation, we've got the Garmin, you know, it's listed down there. Uh, but we deal with companies across the world and everybody is concerned about data, specifically data that leaves their jurisdiction. And you know, everybody wants data hosted and located in their country. And that becomes expensive, it becomes challenging and time consuming. Um, and, and you know, sometimes just not practical. So, so you do have to make sure that your data regulatory and security concerns, requirements, et cetera, are looked after. Um, so get certified as well. You know, Vitality, one of the steps we took was to be ISO 27001 certified and to be GDPR compliant. And that's just a starting point. Um, because if you do ever look at the, at the stats, it's incredible and it's really not if you get hacked, it's when you get hacked. Um, you know, so a hacker attack occurs every 39 seconds. And I think I'll challenge anybody to go and set up a server divorced from your existing environment or your infrastructure or your production environment, but just go and set up a server in a cloud environment, AWS or Azure, give it a standard root name and password and see how long it takes for it to become compromised. It, it will probably take less than 12 hours for somebody to come along and to see, ah, here's a server. It's got a standard root surname, I mean, root password and, and root username, and somebody will start digging around inside that server within 12 hours, guaranteed. More than 93% of healthcare organizations have experienced a data breach. Um, medical devices have an average of 6.2 vulnerabilities each. Doing all of this research scared, scared me, and you know, we had to pass this on to our security officers just to make sure that you know, they do understand or tell, we can reinforce the, their understanding of the fact that you know, things, things are dangerous out there. And, and post COVID-19, the FBI says that there's been more than 4,000 ransom where attacks occurring daily. And we know the Garmin one, I mean, we were down, worried us hugely, but Garmin allegedly paid $10 million to ransomware hackers. Now those aren't API hacks and, and I, will, you know, I will concede but if you have a look at specific attacks from, from APIs, Venmo, Facebook, United States Postal, Postal Services, Just Dial, um, and the Federation of Industries of um, Sao Paulo. So if you have an unsecured API, you will once again get hacked. If you don't do pen tests on it, if you don't do vulnerability checks on it, if you don't get experts looking at it, somebody will come along and consume your API in a way that you don't want them to do so. Um, so and APIs are the, are the gateway to, to your environment. And I think that's, that's quite a key point here is that security is everyone's concern. So once again, don't contribute to the chaos. Um, really, you do need to make sure that your APIs are secured. You need to make sure that you're acting responsibly, uh, responsibly and that you, you're adopting good security practices. So I think that's probably where I can leave it um, because I seem to have run out of slides. I think the key points are that one is APIs have really opened us up to access to data. Um, they've given Vitality Group ourselves a huge amount of capability in collecting data from our wearable partners, from our healthcare partners, um, 
I think we're just touching the surface and a surface. And I think if you go back to that, McKinsey's view is if you have an ecosystem, the challenge for you guys in the, in, in, is to say, well, what data can I leverage off? What data can I expose to other parties that they can leverage off? What are the correlations I can draw? I love this idea that, you know, if I can see that your wearable says you're exercising every day, but it's raining tomorrow from an open API um, on, on weather, why don't you go to a gym? And then I can use a gym API to book your, your, your gym um, session with, with a private trainer or a personal trainer, et cetera. So, so the amount of data that's available that's been exposed through APIs is phenomenal. And I think really, because all we are limited now is by our imagination as to understand how we can leverage off all of these, this access to all of these third party data sources and, and enrich our own ecosystem and contribute to it. But then the flip side is do it responsibly. Make sure that you, you use industry standards and make sure you secure your services because if you don't, you're not going to last out there in the wild with, with the number of, of dangerous hackers, et cetera, out there. 